I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to uh, host those events for you. I hope that they are uh, received with the, uh, the good intent that they are being produced in. We want to make sure that you're uh, on top of uh, everything that's happening. We want to make sure that you are empowered, that we uh, actually, as ICMCI, are able to deliver something, even though we're all working from home or uh, working in, 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 this crazy, in these crazy times that we're facing. Um, again, lovely to see many familiar faces. Um, today, we're going to talk about growing and selling your consultancy. Uh, actually, it's all about scaling it and making sure that it is uh, as strong if you have in mind to sell it, right, Joe? And, and Joe actually is the first academic fellow at ICNCI. We started this back in 2013, I believe, and Joe was the first to be named an academic fellow to ICNCI. Uh, he's a professor of management consultancy at Cardiff University. And after studying history at Oxford, and, and this is very interesting actually, he's a person who studied history. So after studying history at Oxford and completing his PhD at Warwick, he worked for a variety of consulting firms as well as independent, as being an independent consultant. And since then he has started three successful firms and, and maybe you'll tell us more about that, and has researched and published extensively about the consulting industry. So you yourself, Joe, number one, know about history. So that's how you will be <laughs> telling us how to enhance the history of the companies for almost 10 years. And I believe you sold those three successful firms or do you, firms, or do you still have one of those? So, sold, sold <laughs> one of them, and I have two, two still going. Okay, good. So you'll tell us more about that, Joe, and the mic is yours, my dear. Uh, let us understand, let us know how to, uh, what to, and what, is, uh, what it takes in order to scale our firms, especially in this crisis. So please go ahead, the mic is yours, and I will be muting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks so much for this opportunity. It's, it's really kind of you. I'm going to talk uh, relatively fast uh, because I have a lot to get through, but I believe this has been... Um, uh, recorded is that right Rima yep um, and and it will be put up so if I do talk too fast um, raise, raise your hand or post, post a comment in the chat if you've got any questions I believe you can put them in the chat um, and I'm happy to respond um, this is uh, either tough or interesting times at least for everyone um, before COVID started I'd been uh, doing a project looking at how small consultancies grow and um, and are eventually sold. Um, when COVID came along, I, I thought it was going to um, uh, impact the research a lot. However, what I noticed was a lot of the companies that were being successfully sold now were actually started um, during or after the last recession. So um, I, I think post-disaster or post-crisis is a good time to be thinking about growing um, your consultancy. Um, <clears throat> if you don't want to grow your consultancy, it doesn't mean that this is irrelevant. Um, everything that I say, I mean, people want to buy good consultancies and hopefully you want to have a good consultancy if you haven't already, which I'm sure you do. Um, uh, so everything I say works for growing your consultancy whether or not you want to sell it um, because typically buyers who want to, 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 to buy a, a firm want a firm that has predictable um, consistent high margin good clients etc and these are all things that a good consultant would want so I'm, I'm going to run through um, uh, a few things firstly what's what's the problem behind the research project what what the methods are I'm going to talk about what buyers look for when they are looking at consulting firms. And most of all, I'm going to talk about um, five systems that I've identified for growth. And this shouldn't be a surprise for, for any of you, but hopefully it will remind you of things that you should be doing if you want to grow your firm successfully. Um, so what's the problem? Um, now, small firms in many ways are at an advantage. They grow four times faster than large firms. The big success of the consulting industry has been small firms over the last 15 years. Um, there's 300 firms uh, sold each month and those typically aren't very large firms. Typically they are um, uh, 
bringing in revenues of um, around 5 milli million and margins of around 20%, so uh, 1 million pounds in profit. However, that does go up to, say, 40 million. Uh, obviously, the bigger the firm, the bigger chunk of money you get um, at, at the end of it. Um, however, in terms of support for those firms, there's virtually nothing out there. There's a lot of consultancies that will help you once you decide to sell. So once you've hit the £5 million pound point or $5 million, whatever it is, um, there are companies like Equitech who will come in, they'll take a percentage and they will prepare you for sale. What there isn't much of is um, advice for consultancies that want to get to that point. Um, I've got maybe uh, 15 books beside me, probably another 40 books at work, um, and virtually none of them offer any advice on growing your consultancy. So that's why I decided to do this uh, project. Um, what is the, um, what's the methodology I've chosen? Um, I've done si around 65 interviews. 40 of those are with founders who started a consultancy, grew it, and then sold it within typically around 15 years. I'm also interviewing, or I've interviewed 19 founders who didn't, uh, who wanted to scale their firms but failed to get to that point and sell them. Uh, I've interviewed six buyers. Um, I've read a huge number of books and articles. And also I've got my own experience um, helping people uh, grow their small consultancies, but also myself having been and still been a consultant and an ac academic. So that's roughly where I'm coming from. Um, uh, what are buyers looking for? None of this will surprise you. They want solid, sustainable growth. Um, at a minimum, that's 15% growth uh, per year. But depending on the consultancy, can be up to 100 to 200% a year. They want good profit margins of 20% or higher. Um, uh, the higher your profit margins, as I'll talk about in a sec, the bigger multiple you get of your revenues uh, in terms of the price of the consultancy. They want revenues of between uh, four to 40 million pounds or euros or dollars, however you want to scale it. Um, it it's, a, it's an approximation, um, much bigger than that. And there's very few buyers who can afford to buy that type of consultancy. You're talking about the big four, Accenture, um, MBB, um, much smaller than that. And it's really not worth their effort um, because you haven't very often demonstrated that the model can work and scale. They're looking for a niche, unique uh, value proposition um, so that there isn't a lot of competition that can move in. They want packaged, popular intellectual property. I'll talk more about all of these things later. Um, and this is something that consultancies often let themselves down on. Um, they want a distributed client base. Um, I've spoke a lot of the small consultancies that grew and then failed um, were those that were heavily dependent on um, one or more clients. So typically you don't want a client um, consuming more than 20% of your profit margins. I'm um, sorry, 20% of your revenue coming from one, from one client. And then the strong management team. Um, so you've got a good mix here of um, quantitative and qualitative buyers. In terms of who does the buying, it tends to be private equity um, and, uh, and strategic buyers. And by strategic buyers, I mean other consultancies that typically want to take your service or take your product and offer it to their clients. So typically what you'll have is a buyer who has a huge number of, um, of clients. They, want, they can see an alignment between your product or service um, or services, and then they want to scale that and offer it to a much bigger uh, audience. Um, it's a no-brainer for them, and it's also a no-brainer for you if you want your products or services to get to a larger um, audience. Um, private equity and, um, and consultants uh, have different buying criteria. Um, private equity purchases used to be quite low, but now they, they account for about 50% of all consultancy purchases, depending on the, on the cost of debt and depending on the economic cycle. Okay, um, so um, these are the, um, this is your margins on the left-hand side, and this is the price multiple that you'll get. So um, and by price multiple, I mean the amount of cash that you will get in total for your firm, providing that you work the, um, the earn out. Typically an earn out will be a three year period and associated with targets. So if your margins, which I'm guessing most of you would be between the 10% and 30%, um, the price multiple you'll be looking at will be between seven and a half and nine. Um, uh, now this, this will be scaled, this, is, this will all be scaled by how fast your growth is, um, 
what your niche is and therefore what the demand for your product is. The economic cycle, um, now isn't a great time to sell, um, obviously. Um, and branding and communication of, so this, the last point is quite important because you get a lot of consultancies who have a great product, they've got a great unique value proposition, they've got a great management team, but they don't tell anyone about this. And so the, the communication of their branding to their stakeholders, including their buyers, isn't very good. And um, you, I mean, working on that is, is really important. You know, if, if, you can, if you can work on that, then I'm not saying you can put lipstick on a pig, as, as they say, but you can... Um, you, you can uh, put, put a lot of makeup <laughs> on, on a not so attractive animal and, and sell it for a higher margin. Um, I'll talk more about these later if you want. Okay, so this is at the core of the book I'm writing and the course I'm developing around this, uh, which is five systems for growth. Some of this will surprise you, some of it won't surprise you. Some things uh, may surprise you by not being in here at all. Um, I'm happy to answer questions around these. Um, Okay, so what do I mean by a system? I think you know what a system is, so you can go back to this slide in your own time, but it, it's a process for um, creating, measuring, and improving things. Uh, it's, it's not particularly complicated. Okay, so what systems um, allow a consultancy to grow? I don't like the word scale, so I had been using the word scale, but scale, scaling something gives, um, gives the impression that it's easy. Um, I don't know a single consultant that has sold their firm um, which, uh, uh, which hasn't had really hard difficulties doing so, both personally and, and business-wise. Now, you might say, well, that's consultancy generally, and I would probably agree. So if you're going to work hard as a consultant, you may as well work hard to grow and scale your consultancy, grow your consultancy. Okay, so the number one system being the boss, thinking about your business as a boss rather than just a consultant. Most of the small consultancies I give advice to are very much focused on doing the work and they rarely take time to step back, think about the business, think about their value proposition. Um, as a boss, you need to have the right mindset in terms of uh, targeting growth um, and having a explicit criteria to sell your firm within a certain number of years, which means getting it to a certain amount of revenue and a certain uh, profit margin within a certain number of years. Uh, number two, having a powerful niche. Um, this probably is the biggest difference between the firms that successfully, not, not all of them, but successfully grow and those that don't. Um, so many firms are still doing change management, leadership, HR advice. And that's, that's, that's fine. Um, there's reasonable margins to be made, but there's so many people doing it. It's not a niche that sells. Um, uh, with, within HR, within change management, within leadership, there are niches. Um, but being a generalist isn't going, to, isn't going to help you grow, isn't going to help you increase your margins. Uh, number three, having a system for your strategy and plan. Um, uh, uh, again, it, it really, I'm not saying that it needs to be a detailed document, but one of the first things I ask small consultancies is, you know, show me your, your plan for growth. Um, show me the, the clients that you want to target. Show me that the, uh, the project that you need to achieve in order to scale. Show me the revenue targets. Show me the margin targets. And show me the number of people that you are going to need to take on in order to hit those targets. And who are those people? Um, and finally, the boss needs to be in charge of creating and managing those other systems. So ideally, what you want to be able to do, and um, most successful founders kind of achieve this, um, and by successful I mean people that have sold or have grown a consultancy to a point where they can step back. And that is the boss who can step back and be the boss. So you've got other people responsible for sales, you've got other people responsible deliver for delivery, and you're not constantly having to look over their shoulder because you have the systems in place to manage them. Okay, so that's the number one system or set of systems you need to look at. What goes wrong? Um, so I've, I've highly, highlighted some things in red that typically go wrong. Number one, uh, consultants don't like to give away their power, some of them. Um, so they keep it all to themselves. They might bring a, a director on, but they don't want to give them any equity. Um, as, as many people have said in the past, it's much better to have a small share of a huge pie rather than a 100% share of a, of a small, small pie. With the exception of one consultancy, every consultancy that I interviewed started up or when they decided to grow, bought on partners or a partner. And those partners complemented their own skill set, i.e. they made up for the gaps in their own skill set. I know my own gaps. I am great at starting things up. I love growing things. 
I'm useless at systems and procedures. So I always partner with people who have attention to detail and great systems uh, and procedures minds. Um, and secondly, the wrong niche. If you're in the wrong niche, you, you can't scale. I've seen firms sell um, that don't have great systems, that don't have great intellectual property, but they're just in the right niche. They're in artificial intelligence, they're in automation, they're in machine learning, they're in cloud, or at least the management side of that. If you get 20 people like that who have expertise in that area, you can sell for a huge amount of, huge amount of money. Okay, um, number two. So next set of systems we're looking at is expertise. Now, I think everyone on this call would say they're an expert in a, in a specific area. But how much do you spend investing in your own expertise? As, as a consultant, as a growing consultancy, you operate in two markets. The first market is um, the market for, uh, for, for talent. You need to be able to attract and retain great talent. But the second market is the market for expertise. Your margins, the, the, your day rates, or whatever your value charges, whatever you want to call it, is entirely dependent on the value that you can provide. Um, and lots of people see that as a function of marketing and the messaging and marketing is important messaging is important but if you and your firm don't invest in improving your expertise improving the skills and knowledge specifically having a plan for this thing then you're not going to uh, improve your day rates your margins are going to remain low and I just find it astounding the number of consultants that still think that the knowledge that they learnt when they were in industry or when they were in a large consultancy will get them through the next 10 years. And that doesn't necessarily mean doing a master's or a PhD or whatever. Um, it just means constantly looking at your skills, looking at what the clients need, their future demands, etc., and saying, well, is what I've got uh, suitable? Is, is my area of expertise being commodified? How many people do I know who I'm competing with? Have my day rates and margins been going down over the last 10 years? Uh, so these are a set of systems around absorbing knowledge and that might be training, it might be reading, it might be keeping abreast, it might be talking to your clients. I mean, I hope you're all doing that anyway. Um, do you have a system for capturing and sharing that knowledge um, throughout your firm? Make it, it's, it's one of the ways in which you can add value to the client and add value to your own firm, therefore, without breaking your firm's model. So in other words, you are... Um, uh, you're not breaking leverage, you're not breaking your utilization rates, all you're doing is providing a better service because you have better knowledge about client skills, uh, sorry, client's needs. Um, I've probably emphasized that enough, okay. Um, what goes wrong here? Slow pivoting. I mean, if you look around, the, some of the best consultants I, I knew, within three weeks of COVID coming up, they had rebranded some of their services as crisis management or disaster management or something along those lines. There are many people who could have done this, but haven't done this. And what's happened is that the consultants that pivoted early um, onto crisis management, disaster management, communications, PR, or whatever, um, have found that the huge flood of demand for this has enabled their consultancy to grow during this period. So I'd say around half the people that I'm, probably more than half the people that I'm interviewing, their consultancies are actually growing uh, during this period. And that's it's because they pivot quickly. Now, obviously, this isn't just about COVID. Um, uh, management ideas have uh, fashionable cycles, as you know, um, and clients' needs change, or at least the language around those needs changes significantly. If you are not abreast of that language, if you're not abreast of the opportunities of new technology, then you're going to seem like a, a dinosaur. The second big problem is the low investment in expertise. I've talked about that, so I will move on. Services. Okay, so um, to increase, I mean, this, this isn't rocket science, to, to increase your profit margins, Ideally, you want to be breaking away from the cycle of time for money. Even, even if you stop selling your own time for money, but you're still selling other people's time for money, then it's a system that has limits. Ideally, you want intellectual property in software, online training, applications, um, anything where you can break the link between the amount of money the client is giving you, especially if it's some type of retainer or ongoing payment, a license agreement, um, and the value that you're providing them with. Now, even if you can't provide an app or online training or um, uh, uh, video support or, or whatever, um, 
then intellectual property allows you having having highly commodified systems and services obviously allows you to recruit somebody at a lower wage and still provide the same level of quality and th this allows you to break that um, that link between you and the delivery of the work as the boss you need to be able to step back and have the and create those systems and, and services that other people will deliver and the wonderful thing about that is that you can get in graduates to do a lot of this work if your systems and services are well defined um, then then your margins will be higher because lower lower wage people can deliver that work for you um, so you need, it's, it's not just that you need the, system, the services out there, but you need systems to develop those services. Are you producing the right services? Have you um, tested them with the clients? Have you branded them? Have you codified them appropriately? Secondly, when you grow more, you might have several services that you offer. How well aligned are those services? Do they follow logically on a vertical or a, or a horizontal? I mean, there are other ways of growing your firm. You might want to do it by geography. You might want to do it by sector. Um, but many people will do it by service simply because there's opportunities for cross-selling between those services. If they are packaged well, then it allows a buyer to come to you and say, hey, wow, look, we're not dependent on you. In fact, we're not dependent on anyone in the firm. This is the thing that buyers are really worried about. It's that you are going to disappear um, and your team might disappear because you know, bear in mind consultants are some of the most ambitious and, and fickle um, employees. So buyers are really worried about this. However, if you have codified services that are written down, there's a process to them, there's standards, methods, templates, then that is the asset. So you're creating an asset in the firm that is distinguishable from the people in the firm. Absolutely crucial. And finally, as part of that service, do you have a service or method for, um, for ensuring you have successful project delivery? So that's not just having you know, a beautiful brand, 13 steps for, for this service, but also do you have a, a system for, um, for implementing, for measuring the effectiveness, for taking on client feedback, for getting testimonials and all of that type of stuff. Um, I realize I'm going through, so each one of these slides, in fact, each one of these bullet points in this presentation, I could talk about for three or four hours. So do apologize if, if I'm just throwing content at you, but I'd rather do uh, sort of a lot broadly rather than go into one thing in detail. Um, what goes wrong? Uh, number one, minimal intellectual property. Um, and low investment in systems. Your, your job as the boss of a growing firm is to establish systems, and systems are intellectual property, um, and that's certainly how buyers see it. So buyers see intellectual property not just as the, um, as the services and products that you're selling, they also see intellectual property as the systems that you have to manage things internally. And that can be your appraisal system, it can be your recruitment system, it can be your branding or marketing systems. So they're, they're important because, again, they're assets that the firm has that are distinguishable from the individuals in those, in those firms. Marketing. Okay. Um, uh, obviously, you know, uh, uh, if you don't market, this is probably the crucial slide in terms of the consultancy industry. If you don't market well, you're not going to succeed well. Even McKinsey markets, despite their, despite their protestations that, that they don't. Um, as you'll know, the consulting industry has become a lot more competitive over the last um, 15 years. Profit margins have diminished, um, and so marketing is crucial. Um, it always strikes me as amazing how badly some people do parts of this. Um, so number one, thought leadership. And that's not to say any thought leadership. That's to say good thought leadership. And good thought leadership means that it's a new idea, that it's relevant to your services, and that there is a call for action afterwards. It's relatively simple, but I'd say probably only 15% of the thought leadership that I read fits that criteria. Number two, conversion. Do you have a system for converting uh, cold to warm to hot to contract? Um, and again, that's a system that, you know, uh, it's an intellectual property system, but it needs, it needs to be there. It needs to be up on the wall or it needs to be on the computer. It needs to be automated. There's some relatively cheap professional service automation software out there that, you know, you might want to look at um, depending how, how big your firm is. Do you have a system for client relationship management? And I don't just mean the CRM piece of software that you use to send emails every, every so often. 
Um, I mean a coherent system by which you, you build relationships, you take certain notes about who you're talking to, what type of personality they are, what their kids' names are, um, and then you link that to the services uh, uh, that their firm will need in, in the next two or three years um, and the other links that you have in the company. It's, it's, it's obviously crucial. I'm sure most of you are there already, but um, if you want to scale your firm, it's crucial. It's, it's a must have. Um, one of the big, what I speak at speaking to um, a founder of a very successful firm. In fact, I'd say 30% of the successful founders that I've interviewed have said their biggest challenge is constantly feeding the beast. Um, and moving from them being responsible to it for, for the sales to allowing other partners to be responsible for the sales. Um, finally, brand effectiveness. Do you have a, a system for measuring uh, the effectiveness of your brand? Most consultancies don't. Um, in fact, I sometimes give advice on this to, to very large consultancies that, that should know better. What goes wrong with marketing? Number one, useless thought leadership. And the second point is that your marketing isn't joined up. And I, I've got a slide on this simply because I want to emphasize this. It's a relatively quick win. Um, so my slide, um, uh, most, most of you will have um, a website. Great. Um, most of you will do social media. Great. And this is typically what I see. You know, we've got a website, we do social media. What more do we need? Um, well, obviously, this doesn't turn cold to warm because there's very often no link between the two. Some of you might even do LinkedIn uh, and, and or at least have a presence on there. Um, but this, this doesn't get you anywhere. Um, by, by itself and it's relatively easy to link these up so so what and many of you may have may have may, ha may have a blog uh, uh, as well um but if your website doesn't have a landing page then when people arrive um at different points you have no idea where they're arriving you have no idea what they want you no have no idea where they've come from um uh, unless unless you've uh, got a landing page or at least you've got um i don't know facebook pixel or some type of tracking cookie on on your website um if these aren't all linked to a crm system you're leaving money on the table um and you know if, if you have if you're linked up with active campaign or mailchimp if you must um then then you know it is relatively easy to import contacts from linkedin um to drive people from linkedin to your blog or from your blog to your landing page your website shouldn't actually be that relevant. I mean, you, sh you know, it's, it's, it's good to have your testimonials on there, to have a bit about you, to tell your story, give that narrative. But the crucial thing here is your ability to turn everyone that views your LinkedIn, that is on your social media, that makes a comment, that visits your landing page or your website into warm leads, into just making calls to them and sending emails to them. Now, you know, there's lots of people who will give you advice to this one thing to be aware of is that, is that most people that talk about scaling your consultancy and earning, earning seven figures a month or whatever, typically just implement this system. Um, so don't go spending vast amounts of money on people that will in effect just create a funnel from LinkedIn to your, to your um, CRM system and then you end up doing telephone sales, which I don't think anyone wants to do. Um, but having a linked up system for your digital marketing um, is crucial these days and and none of these <laughs> none of this literally i've got i've got these books and i've got another another 30 or so at work about the consulting industry none of them talk about this i mean a lot of them were written 10 years ago um before crm existed properly anyway i'll move on finally the fifth system is people good talent um is hard to get full stop when there are when there is good talent that wants to go into consultancy why would why would they choose your firm over uh, mckinsey bain boston consulting group deloitte they have a brand it's going to look great on the cv why would they choose your firm um uh, and the number one answer to that is culture um, if you don't um enculture your people if you don't embed them in your culture communicate with them consistently act consistently as a leader they will leave um the average career in, in one firm of a consultant is something like three years. Um, and with younger consultants, it's even, even lower. Um, have you got a system for motivating? How do you measure the motivation of, of the people that you've got, got in your firm? Um, how do you uh, measure their skill development? How do you develop their skills? Is it through mentoring? Is it through training? Is it through online training? 
there is no perfect answer. It depends on your niche and what type of business model you have. Um, and finally, with your people, do you have that role standardization that is necessary for leverage, the thing I talked about earlier? What goes wrong with people? Number one, no investment in culture. It's been one of the major surprises to me. I, you know, everyone says culture is important, of course. It was one of the major surprises to me on doing this project that so many founders um, focused on their leadership and the fit of their leadership to their culture in order to recruit the best people. I mean, there's a company called Elixir that have grown from nothing to uh, 50 million. Um, really interesting company. They're up there competing with the McKinsey's and the Baines from nothing. They recruit Oxford graduates. Oxford graduates, um, Oxford and Cambridge, but I don't like to talk about Cambridge too much. Um, they, uh, they, they recruit them over um, McKinsey, Bain, Boston, and it's because of their culture. Um, and they're very good at creating that and managing it. Uh, poorly managed leverage, and this is when your organization, this is when you get larger. But um, the number of consultancies that should be this shape, and they're actually this shape, or they should be this shape, and they're actually that shape, um, is, is remarkable. And obviously, if you are managing your projects like that, you're either putting too low skilled people on it, or you're paying too high a price for high skilled people. And the final weakness that we have around people is having no, no partner. Um, starting and running and growing a consultancy is a very lonely business, as you will know. If you don't have a partner or partners early on, it's, it's not just lonely, but you're also, everyone has their own strengths, but everyone also has their own weaknesses. If you don't have a, have a partner that has strength where you have weaknesses, then the circle is incomplete um, and you're missing out on competencies. Unless you are the perfect person and you have no weaknesses that uh, I guess many of my MBA students uh, believe that might be the case. I'm, I'm joking, they're, they're wonderful people. Okay, so, so that's kind of the end of it. Um, I'm in the process of A, writing a book that will be out next year um, uh, around my findings. More so sooner, I'm creating um, a set of courses around this at consultingmaster.com um, that you may or may not be interested in, um, but it's focusing firstly on very small firms that want to get uh, make the most of, um, of uh, good practice, and then a second course of firms that have got the basics right but want to, want to grow and scale. So what should you be doing if you are a smaller firm? Uh, number one, developing a plan to get to five. I mean, do everything that I've mentioned in this, in this presentation, but in terms of priorities, find a partner if you don't have one. It's not easy, but it is possible. Um, and you, know, you need to be looking at LinkedIn, you need to be asking contacts of contacts, and you need to go out and, and hunt for a good partner. Um, I mean, obviously don't take somebody on if you don't know them and trust them, but you need to start building trust with different senior people so that at some point you can partner up and that may be your firm's merging. It may be um, you becoming part of their firm, but certainly having one or more partners um, creates economies of scale and economies of scope. Um, so you developed a plan, you found a partner, focus on improving your expertise so that you can charge higher prices and join up your marketing. As, as I said before, if your marketing isn't joined up, then you are leaving money on the table. And I don't want that for you. And hopefully you don't want that either. Um, again, apologies if I've, if I've gone through that quickly. I'll be posting some stuff on LinkedIn and I'm sure Rima will be doing stuff. There's the details of me if you want to find me. Um, and if you've got any questions, I think Rima might be asking. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, over to you, Rima. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, too. I mean, that was quick, but that was very intensive, actually. I tried to follow up. I did try. I know that maybe those with uh, better English skills, maybe they followed up well, because I saw, I saw some notes in the chat that people were happy with the speed. So um, thank you for all this. Uh, if I may ask you, please to stop sharing okay. so that we can get the full view of all our uh, attendees together. Uh, on the screen and um, wow, yes I will there are many we have 98 attendees actually this is by far the most attended session that we've had so um, I know that there will be lots of questions and I will moderate those out of the chat so please if you still have a question that you haven't shared with us just type it in the chat for us and we will start with the first question from Jean asking average sale price 
what do you think would the average sale price be? Um, of, well, I, I, so that the average sale price of those that I've that, of those that I've interviewed, which which is around which is around eleven million, um, and then there's the average sale price generally, which is a bit higher, um, not much higher, I guess around um, fourteen to fifteen million uh, uh, dollars. Hope, sorry, mm -hmm. not pounds. I hope that answers your question, Jan. And there's a question from Otto, and it's as follows. Are there angel investors specialized in consulting SMBs who already have organic growth from your experience? Yeah, so um, uh, quite, I guess, quite a few. I mean, obviously, you can grow faster if you, if you, have, um, if you have capital. Um, I, I would stress that most of the consultancies that I've interviewed that have sold successfully are those that have grown from um, grown from uh, cash flow. Um, however, a few of them have been able to grow faster because they had uh, an angel investor or they had somebody early on willing to invest. And that, that provides two benefits. First of all, it provides the capital, but it also provide, it allows you to have a potential buyer at the end of it. So if somebody, you know, if a larger firm typically um, knows you, then it allows them to develop an interest, understand the company, and then you've got an automatic buyer at the end of it. And quite a few of the consultancies that I've interviewed, I guess about um, seven of, of, um, of, of them uh, went down that route. Um, so I, I guess they're hard to find, um, but it relies on you to go out and find them. So um, there are lots of medium-sized consultancies. So what if I was in a position I wanted um, angel investment of for a consultancy, I would go out and find larger consultancies in my area that specialized, that had more services, had access to the clients that I would like to have access to, and say, look, I've got a great team, I've got a great niche, I've got great expertise that you don't have, why don't you take a stake in my firm, you know, small stake, 20%, whatever, um, with a view to, to growing it, and we can, you know, we can look at future investment um, and, and returns on that. Now, obviously there's negotiations that need to happen there in terms of whether or not they take their, they take their dividends out or whether they reinvest that, that money in the firm. Um, but it, I think one of the more common comments that founders gave me is that they wish they'd got um, capital in earlier, either through the form of loan, loans or private, uh, private equity or an angel investor from a larger, larger consultancy. I hope that helps. Well, uh, Jean thinks that this is a good answer. And actually, the whole session is beautiful. And it seems he's good at schemes because he's asking you, would you partner? Would you partner with someone? Would you uh -huh. partner good with a company? Smart, smart or would person. you go in to be a partner with a consultant who's trying to scale his business in order to sell it in 10 years? So I'm, I'm, so I'm a case. That is a serious question. Yeah, Jan. so thank I'm, you, Jan. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm, occasion, I'm occasionally asked about this and my answer up until recently has been, I mean, obviously it depends on the firm, their niche, where they want to get to, you know, what, what stage they're at. I've, uh, speaking about a personal thing, we had two little boys in the last five years and I said to my wife that I wasn't going to be, do, I wasn't going to be doing anything other than my professorship for, for five years. And it's actually Alex's birthday tomorrow. So from then, I'm a free man. <laughs> so I will, be, I will be, you know, taking things a little more seriously in terms of my own consultancy, I guess, doing a bit more work on that and considering partnerships. Um, but yeah, so I'm open to conversations, I guess. Then John, please do contact Joe. Thank you. There's a question from Andre and it's as follows. It was mentioned that we need to partner with someone. However, I tried that three times and it never worked. I understand I can and prefer to grow by myself. In this case, what should I focus on? Okay, so yeah, and, and that, that's quite a, that's quite, quite a common thing. Jump, I guess it, it's like finding a marriage partner or, or a life partner. Um, if, if you jump into bed too early, sometimes it can go, it doesn't work out um, how, how you, how you how you wished um, and I completely understand that and it's much much better to get the right person than than jump into bed with oh, I, I sound like a Catholic priest don't I um, rather than to jump into bed with the, with the first person that you meet um, and I completely get that and that's a challenge that many many people have 
and men, you know, some of the consultancies have been successfully grown um, by 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 one person. Um, I, I guess it requires um, two things. It was going to require more work from you, um, uh, and probably a slower growth rate. But I guess more importantly than that, and people are happy, you know, if people are happy with a slower growth rate to get to the sale point, then that's fine. And eventually you may, you know, recruit directors um, from your own network and perhaps people that you were, used to work with in the past. But I guess my, my big question here is how aware you are of your own limitations and your blind spots. Because, you know, there's, uh, I, I don't like to quote Donald Rumsfeld, but he did say one sensible thing, which is around unknown unknowns. You know, we, we all think we know what our strengths are. We're not all aware of what our weaknesses are. And we may only be aware of some of them. There may be unknown unknowns. And so I guess getting honest, having a good mentor, um, a good uh, coach, somebody that you can work with who will give you honest feedback that has seen this type of thing many times um, is, is absolutely, cru absolutely crucial because con consultants don't lack in confidence. And those of you that follow me on LinkedIn will have seen that I posted something recently about the humble mindset. And it's one of the big themes that has, has come up in my, in my research is that being, it's, it's, you know, it's great being an expert, in a large corporate firm, but when you move to working for yourself, you need to be humble again because you're learning things again. And having that humble mindset is something that will allow you to develop yourself, identify your blind spots and move on. It's not a perfect answer, there's no magic wand I can wave, but, but that's what I'd say is key, is making sure you have a system to understand and improve on your weaknesses. There's one question that I think is related to what you just said, and it's from Anuj asking, what are the factors in those firms that made it? What was common and made them succeed? Okay, so that, that's, that's, everything that, that's everything that I've, I've given in this presentation. Mm -hmm. So th those five systems um, are the, co sorry, I should have emphasized this at the beginning. Those five systems I've given you are the commonalities. Um, and that doesn't mean that if you follow those five things, you know, you're going to have a magic wand and you're going to be incredibly successful. However, it is a hygiene factor. You need to be doing those things. If you want to sell your firm, a buyer, um, if, if, you don't, if you haven't focused on talent, you're not going to be getting good people, your margins are going to be low, and a buyer is not going to look, uh, consider you. It's unsustainable. If you haven't thought about yourself at the bo as a boss, you're not going to be uh, developing the systems that you should have and therefore your intellectual property is going to be low. So every one of those things I've, I've emphasized are common features of firms that have, have grown and sold, but also have grown and decided not to sell. Thank you. We have like 21 new messages and I'm, I'm still at it. So um, another, it's a comment from Vinay saying excellent presentation, but he also has a question. How does one transit from individual relationship to corporate relationship in consulting? Does, does he or she mean with the client? A relationship within, I mean, within the firm itself. If it's a, a company owned by an individual. Vinay, you, you unmuted, yeah. you want to, yeah, please. Yes. Hi, uh, hi, hi, this is a he, not a she. Good, okay. <laughs> okay, and uh, hi Rima, and uh, this is about how do I how do I transit from uh, Vinay being the consultant to my firm being the consultant? You know? Okay, because relationships are typically built with the individual. Yep, yep. And then, uh, of course, if I keep using my time, then obviously I don't. Yep, know. yep. Sure. Okay. Thank, thank you for thank you for thank clarifying you, that. I, 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 I initially I thought you meant moving from a corporate world to to your own consultancy, but 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 you actually oh, yeah. mean um, moving away from moving towards you being the boss. Um, and, and what happens to those, to those relationships? Well, I, I guess you, 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 you know, there's, there's two things. One is, um, you know, as, as a boss, the relationship that you already have still meet, need to be, you know, uh, maintained and nurtured by, by you, you know, as a boss, you can't spend your time playing golf with your feet up, smoking fat cigars. Um, you need to you need to maintain those relationships. However, you can also introduce new people into those relationships. Um, a lot of small consultancies they they all um, 
uh, face the same challenge, which is, you know, they'll be there doing the project, doing the project, and suddenly they'll turn up and there's someone beside them. And the client will say, well, who's this? And you'll say, oh, it's Claire. She's going to be doing the work from now on. I'll see you later. Um, and they're terrified of that. Now, obviously, there's a process by which you need to manage that in terms of, you know, convincing the client that you've got the right people, that the systems are there, that they're adhering to the same quality, that they are not missing out. Communicating honestly with your clients about your ambitions to grow into a larger company and the way in which you're going to be doing it will allow you to provide greater value for them. So there is a conversation that you need to have about your ambitions and plans with the clients that you've got. So that's the first thing, your own, your own contacts. However, you, you're not going to grow the company just based on your own, your own contacts. Um, the partners that you bring on, one of the things that you need to look at when you're thinking about bringing people on is their network. It's not, it's not their skills of delivery as a consultant, at least later on. Um, it, it's their, their network, their contacts, who they sold in the past, what reputation they have in the industry, what have their, you know, what have their LinkedIn pro, profile looked like. Um, and and it, it is difficult, um, but it is a challenge that needs to be done. And that is bringing on consultants who are good at selling. And the, the, answer, the, the question that I always get is, well, if a consultant's good at selling, they're going to want to st set up their own consultancy. And that may, that may be the case. Um, but that's, that's reliant on you to build a culture that creates motivation and loyalty. Um, many good salespeople don't want the hassle of having to do the accounts, having to manage people. Um, so, so bringing on people with those sales skills and with that sales network. So I guess there's two things. The first is you transitioning your own personal relationships from you to you and someone else. Um, and the second thing is expanding your network by bringing on the right people who have sales skills and getting all the other marketing stuff uh, right that you, you, know, you will know about. I hope Thank you. That was useful. Thank you. Cheers, Thank, you, Thank you, Joe. To the next question, and it's uh, from Miesra, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Um, thank you for the opportunity. My question is, what if I have a niche, but the market doesn't provide economy of scale? Miesra, can you, can you tell me what, what niche this is? Can, are you going to take, take yourself off mute? You would need to unmute, yeah. What, what niche is it and, what, and why doesn't it scale? Oh, do you, is it something like coaching? I'm trying to see if my sir is still with us. She is with us, but I can't hear her. Sorry, my sir. Can't hear you. Okay, so un unless, unless I can hear you, it doesn't matter. You, you keep trying, but so, so there are things that there are obviously services um, that, that you can't, that are difficult to scale. Um, however, I, I would also say that there, one of the things I really pre press people that I coach on is, 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 really, is really looking looking at that. So what you specifically do might not scale, might not grow, might not be commodifiable, but there may be things aligned with that. You know, there may be um, uh, videos uh, that you can create that will support your work. There may be systems, there may be templates, there may be processes. <coughs> oh, I, can, I can hear a baby in the background. I think that might be James Brewster. Um, <laughs> um, I've got two downstairs. I apologize, sorry. It's, it's all right. Don't worry, it's all right. I understand completely. Um, so, so do think really, in, you know, in, in some detail around, around that, but also you know, even if you can't provide the intellectual property in terms of a course or in terms of an app or in terms of whatever, can you provide, can you create a system which allows more junior people to deliver what you're doing? And, you know, your initial reaction will be, well, I can't trust them. I'm going to be looking over their shoulder. They're not going to do it as well as I am. That is all true. But you, in order to scale, you need to sacrifice some control and sometimes some quality initially, but I would actually argue in the long term, the quality improves because it's more standardized and predictable um, uh, around that. So I would say, um, firstly, number one, think, think really, can, can, it be, can it be commodified? Secondly, um, 
And secondly, think, think, think around that. Um, <laughs> if, you, if at the end of that, you think genuinely, this can't scale, it's niche, it's all about me, then focus on, on increasing your margins. Um, don't worry too much about, about scaling, the, scaling the company and the services. Think about your margins and as, as a result of that, your, your target audience. Uh, your target clients, um, you will find that if you think about them globally, you're, you're probably focusing on you know, the connections that you already have, um, you know, friends, people that you've worked with for a long time or whatever. Um, if you have a good marketing system and a good branding system and you're really investing in your own self, then you're going to be able to target that 5% who will pay you double or treble what you're, um, what you're charging now. Um, I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, another and many questions. So maybe from now on, Joe, you start kind of taking less time to answer. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Andre, no, no, it's your platform, hey, but I need to make sure that we satisfy everyone. Tell you what tell I'll me. do. Tell you what I'll do. At the if end, any question is unanswered, we'll put them in writing. You'll yeah, have the answers, and we'll send them to everyone. Okay. Yes. Okay, the question is, uh, the partners, even very well prepared, did not want to work as hard as myself, yeah. which is it's all about commitment. So I was working for both and sharing the results, which is not fair. Well, Andre, I feel, yes, it is not fair. <laughs> Go on, Joe. It, <laughs> it is, it's definitely not fair. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, so much of this is going to depend on you know, on the contracts that you have, that the, uh, the you know, the, your business model, who these people are, whether you trust them and how long you've been working together and how dependent you are on them for, <clears throat> for their own work. But, you know, you need to, you need to be thinking, uh, <clears throat> number one, are they bringing you down? So I guess, I guess there's, you know, are they, are they actually damaging the company? In which case we, you need to be splitting off by yourself and, 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 and getting rid of them. Um, or perhaps they're just not, you know, they, they might have, you know, kids, uh, they might, you know, be ill, they might just not be as motivated as you uh, to the same goals. And, and that requires, you know, that requires a, sh a shift in the contract. So I don't know how you reward, reward each other or take rewards out of the business. But it's, it's relatively common that, that partners have, have different aims. Um, this, this is one area where um, early angel equity or private equity can help. Um, because it allows you to buy uh, buy them out or re reshuffle the the contracts that you have, um, so it's it's hard to give advice about your specifics without you know going into a long answer. Um, but uh, number one, seriously consider if you need to dump them, start off by yourself. Um, number two, um, if not, then let's look at the reward patterns and make sure that you're getting a bigger slice of the pie for your work. Just dump them. <laughs> okay, um, a question from Mila, and it is as follows. Uh, first, I think it's a he. Uh, he says, Joe loved the enthusiasm, but as a start, as a startup, does your advice or approach differ? What would you suggest are the key priorities for a startup that has ambition to get a $5 million plus? Well, to I, get to five million dollar plus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, I know this sounds this, this, this. I mean, the good thing is you've got the ambition, um, and the other good thing is you, you have, you know, you've, you, you, in, in those slides, you've got pretty much all the things that you need to be doing. <laughs> um, in, in terms of priorities, um, if, if I was. I mean, it's really the thing that I said. I said at the end, in in terms of you know, find a find a partner, think of yourself as the boss, in, invest in your in your expertise, um, and and really really get marketing. Uh, you'll you'll. I mean, that eighty twenty thing, you know, about you know, twenty twenty percent of your clients will be your star clients. That'll be wonderful. So many small consultancies I know get dragged down by the by the others so by the other. You know, another eighty twenty rule. Twenty percent of them will will take up eighty percent of your time. Um, so. The, have go through the presentation again i realize i talk quite slowly but everything in there is suitable you you may need to stagger it so you might need to focus first of all on getting i mean focus first of all on getting your niche right is it a valuable niche 
what will people pay? What's the competition? What's your unique value proposition? And then investing and communicating that, and then everything else uh, to follow. You know, that, that's, you know that, that's what I would say. And the follow-up question actually from Milap, and, and the question is as follows. The consultancies that you interviewed and consequently sold, did the founder or partners all come from an established consultancy firm? No, no, there was a good mix. I mean, some, some of them did. Um, uh, many of them, I mean, many of them left with, with, with clients, which really helps. But no, so, some of them, uh, some of them just were working for industry and found a, uh, a niche that they were particularly good at. They saw a need that wasn't being filled by their own, by their own um, company and so left to do that. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, many, by the way, comments are about thank yous, great presentation, oh, and you. can't wait time. to uh, reread and relook at the at the presentation. So everyone's happy with That's what you did, time. even though you speak too quickly. Um, <laughs> uh, Shavdar has, uh, I think it's a comment question. Uh, hello, is it good to have different approach for different niches? I still, I'm still. I still can't reject any niche, but always find different consulting approaches to reach outcomes for the client. Yeah, I mean, it is both. <laughs> I mean, typically the, the, this, this works as, as a diamond. Um, so so what, what you don't want to be doing, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is just my experience. There's gonna be things that I haven't seen, things that I haven't studied. There's gonna be niches I know nothing about. So I can only give you my own experience, <coughs> excuse me. my own experience on this and um, and that is that <clears throat> the smaller niche you start off with the better once you've established yourself you've got the market then you start expanding your services and it's then that you want to sell <coughs> drink some more sorry um yeah, I think I've been shouting at my little boys too much. My phone's all um, so I'm not. Well, they kept you awake last night, so that's they why. They keep me awake last night. Um, yeah, and and you know, if if you don't have a defined niche, number one, you're not going to accumulate the expertise that allows you to increase your margins. Number two it's much harder for you to target the, uh, the, the specific client niche that you, you serve. Number three, your branding uh, and unique value proposition is going to be confused. And there's lots of consequences of that in terms of um, your, your ability to, to scale. So, you know, I, and, you know, some of you might say I do two or three things. You know, one, one company that I've, I've, I've uh, been closely involved with, does sort of a wine tasting course and the leadership course. Now they do overlap, but they're very different things. Um, and, and, and that's fine, but you need to brand them differently. You need to market them differently. You need to message them differently. So I'm not saying you can't have different niches, but you know, don't spread yourself too thin and make sure the marketing is specific for each of those niches. I'm going to take one more answer because actually we're, Two minutes away from uh, from the time and it's as follows is from dr Pardeep, and uh, the question is as follows while talking about scaling consultancy what's your take on effect of covid19 on consultancy business how much reduction in assignments is expected so overall, there we're looking at a 20% reduction. Uh, I've done a couple of surveys around this. What I'm seeing is around 30% um, of consultancies have found their business go up. Um, about 20% uh, have said that there's no uh, change at all in their revenues, not necessarily their clients or the project they're doing. And 50% are saying that it's hit them quite badly. Um, now, uh, so that's the situation at the moment. Um, what's going to happen coming coming out of this is uh, your guess is as good as mine. Um, it, the proje projections seem that it is neither a U nor a W nor a V-shaped curve. It kind of comes down sharply and then there's a slow um, uh, growth. But it, it, it does require you to pivot. Oh, in, in many cases, it requires you to pivot. There's If you are suffering, there is no point you continuing to do the stuff that you have been doing for a long time. 
Um, you, you need to be pivoting your services, marketing aggressively, and having the conversations that clients are interested in hearing about now. You'll only find out about that by talking to your clients. All right, thank you, Joe. Okay, there's, um, I think we can take one more question. We still have a minute. Uh, and it's from Zarar Shalkat, and it is as follows. I'm a Prince2 and PMP certified individual and would like to know how to develop niche in a particular domain or field. Does any industry knowledge is necessary to work as a project management consultant? Thanks. <laughs> okay, so project management isn't my area of expertise. Um, so, you know, you'll probably know the answer to this uh, better than me. My, my own experience is that um, clients like to have industry expertise, um, even with project management, even though in my view, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. I've worked in on many different projects with many different project managers, and they all generally take the same approach. But for some reason, when clients are, are, are recruiting project management managers, they do want uh, industry uh, expertise. Um, so I, so I, I possibly wouldn't focus on the industry um, as a as as the niche. Um, I, you know this better than I do. So if you think there's good reason to, then then do so. But also consider geography. Also consider um, the the specific type of um, of project management or the type of projects that you are managing. So there's going to be different ways of cutting the pie up. It might be by geography. It might be by sector. It might be by service. It might be by something else. Um, and you'll know that better than me, but you need to be thinking about where, the, you know, where you can make the biggest impact, where the competition is least, and where the value is most in terms of revenue for you, and profit margins, obviously. Thank you. I can see that there are many questions left. I'm not sure if we can take more of your time or I'm, I'm um, finish on the time. I'm here for as long as you want, as, as long as you want me. But what I mean, as I said before, I'm also happy to, to write a document that replies to all We will do that. Once we download the, the video and we download all the chat, we'll, I'll send you all the questions uh, to include the ones that were answered, but also the ones unanswered and highlight those for you. And um, when the video is done and the answers are ready, we will upload the video send you an email to include the link to it, send you in the email the uh, presentation itself, and we'll send you the answers to the questions. Okay. Uh, those and that went unanswered, okay? Um, I can't but say thank you. Thank you for being thank with you. us. Again, it was the most attended session, and Joe, you did great. Thank uh, you. You speak quickly, but actually you hit the nail on the head. Uh, everyone was interested. Many questions came in, many thank yous came in. And um, I believe it's such, it is so rewarding to us and to Joe, I believe. Joe, yeah, that at least we're, we're able to uh, assist and make sure that even though we're all in quarantine or still businesses didn't go back to normal, at least we're uh, gaining knowledge and making sure that we're and up to par. Can, can I quickly ahead, say, if, if, if any of you, I mean, if, if you do, if you disagree with something I've said, do please let me know. Um, you know, I, I, I'm keen on learning and improving, you know, myself. I've been, I've been studying the consulting industry for 15 years. I've been doing it for 25 years, but um, I realize we've got a very diverse group of people here. So, you know, do, do please give me critical feedback to my, to my email or um, to Rima and she can pass it on. And your email is in the presentation, so yep. they will get it. And, and yes, um, do provide him with input. Remember, he's writing a book, so maybe you'll end up being included there. Yep. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. It was one hour well spent at my end. I hope it's the same at yours. And we will keep you updated of all the sessions that we have for next month. We're taking a break for one week, and then we might start again with more sessions during July. So uh, have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend, which is coming up, and you actually empower us all. Thank you very much, and God bless. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks Ciao. for the opportunity. You're most welcome, Joe. You did great. Thank, Thank you, Rima. Take Thank care. You.